do this stuff in person. But what I want to share with you guys is a way I've converted one of my activities into a remote experience. And in order to do that, I'm going to give you just a small taste of what that felt like. So in a moment, you'll see in the chat window a link. The link will take you to a landing page. Don't click on anything yet. The landing page is just there. Just rest on it. So in a moment, we will open up four uh, breakout rooms. Remember the number of your breakout room because that will tell you which button to click on because that's your group number, okay? So in a moment, we'll say, ready, set, go. And what I want you to do as a group, now granted, it's going to be a large group because there are tons of people here. So just manage as best as you can. This is just sort of a dry run so that you can see what the experience is like. As a group, you need to figure out what the puzzle is, solve the puzzle, and then in the top right hand corner, there's a little box where I want anyone who feels bold enough or adventurous enough to write the word done in a way that you think will grab my attention. So make it as large and as bold and as colorful as you can once you think you've successfully completed the puzzle. Okay, so David, you can release the breakout rooms. Remember the, the breakout room number because that's your group number. And then you'll have to click on the link that relates to your group number. Everybody understand? All right. Awesome. Go. All right. So. Okay, oh, that was you... way too fast. Way too fast. I know, but I am working on the time constraint, <laughs> so I didn't want to let you in there for forever. If if anyone is curious about the order, then we'll talk about that in the chat afterwards. But that just gives you a sense. So picture that, but a sequence of four of those puzzles, and that is what I'm calling my puzzle tournament. So as you can see, it's all run through. Uh oh, someone didn't it didn't get work. Hopefully you'll understand as I give the, the description of what happened. So everyone gets a chance, everyone sees the, the the puzzles. Instead of one, there'll be a sequence, and I'll show you how I built. So that's what I want to share today is how I built the sequence of puzzles, how I ran them using the breakouts and, and breakout rooms and Zoom and everything. And hopefully there'll be something useful in there for you to try out your class. Before we get into the nitty gritty of how exactly I built all the different stuff, I wanted to give you a sense of what I was thinking about, why I chose this format, this puzzle tournament format, and why I chose Google Slides, uh, just in case you are thinking of trying something like this so you understand what are the pros and cons of doing something, uh, some an activity like this. So why this format? The puzzle format, I use this as a form of retrieval practice. It's a great form of retrieval practice. And instead of just having the students respond to me throwing questions at them and just regurgitate information, having them use the knowledge to solve puzzles makes the information more sticky and makes it a more engaging experience. And then you layer on a level of competition and, and um, you know, just, the, just as a novel dynamic, then it becomes a novel emotionally charged experience. And again, that helps them remember the information uh, better, even beyond the, the quiz or whatever assessment that I'm using it for. In addition to the retrieval practice, this format, I usually split them up into groups of four or five. So they're usually not as large as what we did here, but they're usually in groups of four or five. And it encourages collaboration. Collaboration isn't one of the things that I teach in the class, but as much as possible, I like to have the groups, have them into small groups. As mentioned in one of the presentations before, there's benefits to having people in small groups, having to uh, learn how to collaborate with other people, in addition to the fact that it takes a little bit of the pressure off of the students, because they know that even if they haven't learned everything, or they can't remember anything, they can sort of tap into the collective memory of their group. So it makes it a little bit less uh, high stakes of an uh, experience. So then why Google Slides? Why not one of the many uh, plethora of platforms and, and tools that are out there? And one of the big things that I like about Google Slides is that everyone can contribute at the same time. Everyone in real time can be in the same file and be contributing and everyone can see it, which is not something that, uh, that you can do with some of the other competition or custom game platforms. So I've tried Kahoot and, and quizzes and, and uh, Poll Everywhere and all these other software platforms that allow for individual competition. 
but to keep the small group format, Google Sites definitely has uh, the better uh, feature set. In addition, Google Sites allows for a variety of inputs. So if you've ever tried any of the other, for example, Kahoot, it's basically pressing a button, pressing a button in the multiple choice question or poll everywhere where you're inputting text. But Google Slides allows you to drag and drop like you just did, uh, input text, draw shapes, upload images. So there's a diverse array of puzzles that you can create and a, a diverse arrays of inputs and activity that you can set for your students. And that's one of the reasons why I like it. But, and there's always a but, the concession that you have to make if you're going to use a Google Slides, as far as I know, there's no way to program an automatic checking of, their, of the answers. So if, you, if it's really important that you be able to set it and forget it, then definitely try Google, Sly, uh, Google Forms, Kahoot, Quizzes, all the others that have programming baked into it. Google Slides means, and if you do what I'm about to show you and build it the way I'm about to show you, you will have to have a set up where you can monitor each group and then manually check their answers and then release the next puzzle. That's a small concession for me because I'm converting it from an in-person exp experience. And for me, the biggest learning opportunity was them working in small groups and then being able to collaborate at the same time. So it wasn't a huge deal for me to have to monitor the slides. And I'll show you how I put together the little setup so that I can see everybody's at the same time. All right, so let's get into the creating of the puzzle. So what I chose for my tournament, which I affectionately dubbed the gauntlet to strike fear into the hearts of my students are four rounds. The first round uses the drag and drop where the students have to place typefaces in the correct box. Round two is also drag and drop where they have to place the correct anatomy terms on letters. Round three, they have to unscramble words. And then round four is a crossword puzzle. So step one, of course, is you have to plan your puzzles, create your puzzles. So it's no surprise that I'm keeping everything in the Google verse. So I basically usually uh, plot out what I'm going to test them on based on what we've covered in the class. And this is pretty simple. There's no rocket science to this. I'm basically just writing out the terms and definitions that they should all know by now, and then making that creating clues that were, to which there would be, be the answers. It's, just, it's similar to just creating a quiz, but I'm just having a little bit more fun to it. So these first three rounds, as you can see, there, there's nothing special about them. I'm basically just going to use images and have them identify terms. But the real tricky one was the last one, because I wanted to use a crossword puzzle. So I have my clues and my descriptions laid out, but how do I create the crossword puzzle? Enter the teacher's corner. So this site I found after much uh, consternation and digging basically creates the crossword puzzle for you. So here you have, you put your title, you put your description, you just input your words and your clues, scroll all the way down, and then it says make crossword puzzle. You press make crossword puzzle, presto. It makes it for you. And then from here, you can download this as a PDF. I recommend downloading it as a PDF, and I'll show you why in a little bit. And now you have your crossword puzzle, and you're ready to go. So you have all of the puzzles ready. Now you need to just build them in Google Slides. And this is sort of just a time lapse of me building the first puzzle in Google Slides. I'll open up a demo and show you what the end result is, just like any self-respecting baking show. Here's one I prepared earlier. So these are just shapes and text objects that I created. And these are all uploaded images that I brought in so that they can drag it and put it where they want to. Same for puzzle three, puzzle two, sorry. Now here, a note, learn from my mistakes. Here, I put these as text objects. And you can see how easy it is to click and accidentally select the object and then accidentally delete things. So the next time I do this, I am going to make these images. If you want to use the drag and drop functionality, make sure that the students can't accidentally mess it up in any way. So I would recommend making any kind of drag and drop uh, object an uploaded image that you bring in. And obviously you do that, just move this bar over here, do this by clicking on this and click upload from your computer. Same thing for the crossword puzzle. All of these little boxes are just text boxes. 
And so I'll show you how that was created. This little time lapse show you that I have the PDF that I got from that teacher's corner. You click open, open the PDF and then you create an image of it. That image then goes into, as an, an uploaded image, into the Google Slides. And now they have that as a template. And this is the reason why I like using uh, the PDF, because you can just copy and paste from the PDF into Google Slides the clues in their correct number and in, in their correct order. All right. And so now you see here I'm creating these text boxes. And the reason why I use text boxes instead of just letting the students Yeah, instead of letting the students create their own is that I don't want them to be concerned or worried about creating boxes. I just want them focused on solving the puzzle. So all they need to do is double click, put in their answer here. Okay. So at the end of the process of building, you should have your slides all, all each of your puzzles on an individual slide. Now, the next very important thing is, just like I mentioned about the text objects, you want to lock any elements you don't want students to accidentally delete or change or move. And so the way you do that, or the way I've found to do that, is you grab all of the objects, you go edit, cut, you go slide, edit master, and in these down here, you'll see it says layouts. Just grab one of the layouts, edit, paste. So now you have this layout. If you want to be very meticulous, you can name that layout, but I won't do that right now. And then when you go back to the main slideshow, you go into layout and then you just find the slide that has that. And now all of that stuff is in the background and it's locked down in a layout. So the only thing that the students can do is drag and drop the images. And so you do that for all of the puzzles that you don't want students just accidentally doing things and they'll make your life a lot easier later on. Yep. All right. So that's building out the puzzles, one on each slide, but you're not done yet because now you need to set up the tournament. There are a couple of additional things that, are, that I found helpful once you've built out the puzzles so that you ha now have a fully fledged tournament that you're going to run. First spot is the once you notice, uh, you notice this when I did the demo with you, it's a little spot for you to communicate with the students. Now, because they would have a sequence of puzzles rather than just one puzzle, it was useful for me to put a little spot where they could get a notification from me or a notice from me saying, hey, you're almost so close, you're so close, oh, think about this or whatever, whatever. And there's a way for me to communicate with the group without the rest of the class hearing it, because they're all in their separate breakout rooms. They're not going to hear me. They're Everyone is going to see the chat, but they're not going to be paying attention to the chat. So this way, putting that little communication device, and the way I do that is I go into, and this is just one I prepared earlier, I go into the master slide now, and I put that on the side. And so once it's on the master slide, it shows up on every slide. So I don't have to duplicate that. And even more important than for a way for me to communicate with the students is a way for the students to indicate to me that they're done. Just as you experienced there, when you'd finished the puzzle, I'm trying to monitor all of the groups at the same time. So it's useful for the students to be able to get my attention and say, hey, 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 look over here. I think we're done. Give us the points. Release the next puzzle. And then just to make things neat, the next step is to conceal the next rounds. So again, when I launch the puzzle, the students are going to be able to see all of these slides. And what I don't want is that uh, some enterprising students to say, OK, you deal with puzzle one, I'll deal with puzzle two, Jim will deal with puzzle three, and Sarah will deal with puzzle four. We'll be done in 10 seconds. I was like, I don't want that. So what I do is I go into the slide, Edit Master again, and I just put a little box to cover up the clues. And then when it comes time to release the clue, when they've successfully completed puzzle number one, then I would just go in, slide, edit master, and just delete the box. And now that's their indication that the, the next puzzle, and they'll notice the next slide changes. And then when they notice that change, they'll go in and it's like, oh, okay, here's what the next round is. 
and then it just keep, continues until the end of the puzzle. And so the last, well, not the last step, but this little piece that I thought would be useful is a little congratulations slide so that the teams know when they've won or what position they came in. So I had one for first place, second place, third place. And just a little fun way I like, the, my favorite website for this is a site called giphy.com. So it's G-I-P-H-Y.com. You just go in and search, put a term in there. I put congrats. And this is another reason why Google Slides is a great uh, choice for this, is that you don't have to download anything. You just right click, go copy image address, go in and to the slide masters, find the slide, the congratulations slide that you want, go over here where it says insert image, and you go insert image by URL, paste that URL from Giphy, and there's, there's your nice little GIF. And so now it's in a layout, but it's not visible to the team. And once they've successfully completed uh, the, the last puzzle, all I need to do is create a new slide, apply the right layout, and then they get a notification by the fact that there's a new slide on there with a little gift saying, hey, you did great. All right. So the basically the puzzle piece is created. That entire slideshow is just one master slideshow. But because you're going to have multiple teams, you need to duplicate that. So I just create multiple duplicates of that one slideshow. So it's good to have everything created and done and finalized before you make multiple copies, because then you'll have to duplicate your, your efforts. So for the class that I did it this past semester, I only had three groups, created cop three copies of them. Make sure, oh, and that's another thing, make sure the sharing privileges over here in the top right corner, make sure that is shared so that anyone on the internet can link and edit. I made that mistake and, a lot, and group number two was very irate that they couldn't get in uh, and they felt it was unfair that other groups got in. So just double check your sharing privileges. And then the last step now is to create the gateway. That page that I shared with you that has all the links to the different groups, that be become, this is the gateway I used for my class. That becomes even more important now that I'm using Zoom because I just need to share one link and all of the groups can just click on that one link and then click on their appropriate button and then disperse and go in the different ways that they need to go in. Uh, instead of me having to copy and paste a link for each group that's three times, that takes you know way too long. They just need to have one link to share. And the way I did that is just basically create another Google slide that just has one slide and it has these three buttons in there. Each of these buttons are made to link by going insert link and they're linking to their copy of the game piece. And then the link that I share isn't this link. Uh, this, what I do is in, in the URL, if you can see, it's very tiny on the screen, but in the URL at the top, there's a word called edit in there. You just select the word edit and then type in preview. And now it, it's basically a landing page where everything is linked like it was like if it was an HTML page. Yeah. So now you've created your tournament, you've created your gateway, you run to tournament. This is the easy part. The easy part, this is, a C, this is a screenshot of what my screen looked like when you were playing your game. So what I have is each of those game pieces for each of those groups is a, a separate tab in my browser, and I have them all laid out in the plan so I can see all of them. And this gives you a visual of why it's important to have that communication spot so that I can see when they say done, when I see a big glaring done up in the top right corner, then I know, oh, let, now it's time to check. So the order of events, create the breakout rooms, share the link to the gateway, then open the breakout rooms. I tried it before where I created the breakout rooms and then shared the link in the chat and had some issues with some people being in a breakout room and not seeing the chat or having some convoluted mess trying to get back into the chat to see the link. So the order in which we did it today, where I told, I shared the link, had everybody on the gateway, and then when the breakout room comes up, they know the room that they, the, the button that you need to click, that tended to be the one that has the smoother uh, outcome. So this is a screenshot of the, what my screen looked like when I did it for my class. As you can see, there's some students over here who are trying 
really, really hard to get my attention. Some students were just a little less, you know, less confident. And that's basically it. So I know I blazed through a lot of things and I've been seeing the chat blowing up. So maybe now would be a good time to take those questions or comments. Or maybe a, a quick minute before the next one. And I think that there's a general request if you could do this as a five hour workshop. <laughs> It wouldn't need to be five hours. It probably just need to be one hour. I, I blazed through a lot of the, the, the minutia, but it really doesn't take that long. So there's a quick question from Nigel. What, what group size is, is this run with? So I have a class of 18 students and depending on how I've incentivized them to be able to show up. So sometimes I use the term the gauntlet and I strike fear in their heart and some of them take it a little too seriously. So they don't show up to class, but the ideal size is 18 students broken up into three groups. Great. So four or five students in each group. Well, sorry to make you compress so much good information in such a short period of time, but we did record it. So if you guys want to play it back at like a quarter speed or whatever, <laughs> and, and certainly yeah. again, we, we are inviting speakers that have so much more to offer to, you know, we'll, we'll host a, a, a actual workshop where you can go through and everyone can create something. So thank you so much, Andrew. That, that really was fantastic. I think Lisa called you the, uh, the Google slides whisperer. And I think that's, that's <laughs> going to be your new, uh, your new handle.